Welcome everyone to our June webinar for the Ascolite Teleadvisors uh, Special Interest Group. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. In my instance, I'm on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past and present. If you haven't been to a uh, Teleadvisors uh, event before, we are a special interest group, part of uh, Ascolite, and we are essentially a community of practitioners for people working in the third space in education. So sort of sitting between administration and learning and teaching. This includes learning designers, academic developers, education technologists, and everyone that occupies this kind of liminal, blurry thing where we help teaching and learning, but we don't necessarily do it ourselves. Uh, if this is a space that you're working in and you're not currently involved, uh, we certainly are very keen for people to engage with us. And I'll share a link in the chat shortly um, for people to uh, join our space on Teams. Today's webinar is about learning, testing and developing adaptive expertise with Drs. Cheryl Ma and Lise Conde. Lise Conde is the Senior Learning Designer at the Victorian Academy of Teaching and Leadership and plays an intrinsic role in the development of professional learning to support school leaders across Victoria. Lisa's expertise in the educational sector stems from 10 years of experience as a trainer and nine years of experience as an instructional learning designer. Cheryl, uh, Cheryl Ma, believes that education has the capacity to transform lives and works across the sector to identify opportunities to improve efficiency, sustainability and inclusion. Uh, her career highlights so far include developing Prax My Way to support first year biology at CDU and supporting the vertical integrated masters at Monash University and also introducing the DEER framework, del delivering the digital learning strategy for the College of Science, Engineering and Health at RMIT with a focus on inclusion and more recently developing professional learning for teachers at the Victorian Academy of Teaching and Leadership. So with that, uh, I will hand over now to Lise and Cheryl to um, talk about this fascinating field. Thank you, Colin. And hi, Cheryl. Great to see you again. Uh, Cheryl is uh, in Canada, so I'm really glad that she could join us today. Um, uh, so we're going to start by having you um, think about what was the last course you designed, taught or worked with um, in this presentation or through this uh, little hour with us. We're going to invite you to reflect on that learning design. Um, so if you have, a, let's say, a summary, a visualization or anything that reminds you of the um, of the details of that learn design, bring it up, you'll use it um, and to reflect on it. Um, I thank you, Colin, for acknowledging um, the traditional owners of the land. Uh, when it comes to learn design, I think there's a really, uh, I think of learn design sort of in the lines of a song line, of original song lines. Um, and I do understand that I would original song lines where um, you know they were built and, and, and sort of um, uh, around this 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 idea of how to uh, it, it the, the song line itself involved instructions and uh, about how to walk through that song line what to eat um, you know all of these instructions as to how to have a successful journey to where you were going and I like to think that you know lend design kind of has a uh, a little bit of a link to that because our work is about touching people's minds and creating a journey for them to be successful in what they do. So uh, 
Today, what we're going to be doing is just introducing uh, the idea of adaptive expertise. What is that? Uh, why is that important, especially in the field of the Victorian Academy of Teaching and, Le and Leadership? We're going to see some of examples uh, of how to develop adaptive expertise. Uh, we're going to introduce uh, a classification that we're currently using and the journey that got us there. Uh, and we're going to be um, using that as a way to help you reflect on your own learn design approaches. So at the Academy, at the Victorian Academy of Teaching and Leadership, we were called BASTO, we were the BASTO Institute of Teaching and Leadership as of last year. And uh, uh, it, it is, we are an authoritative, uh, uh, um, an eight, a part, an agency that actually deals with um, delivering uh, evidence-informed and inspiring professional learning to Victorian leaders and uh, and and school leaders across Victoria. Um, we deliver professional learning to over 5,000 leaders and teachers within the Victorian education sector. Um, and we have this framework of the Victorian leadership framework, and we'll talk to you a little bit about how we got to this framework here. But what we do is, at, back in 2016, uh, we started thinking about uh, we got we went through an audit uh, about um, an, uh, we got an audit done to understand exactly how um, we were going about developing this professional learning. Uh, what we what that audit determined is that we didn't have a framework or a language to really talk about our work, and so. At the the academy or Basto at the time endeavored into this research journey in which um, we actually engaged uh, Vivian Robinson, Helen Timperley, and Kate Twyford to develop leadership um, this leadership capability framework, which is made up of dispositions and capabilities uh, as well as professional practices, with the objective to actually develop adaptive expertise. And we're going to go and, and talk to you about what that means. We also develop some uh, 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 um, learning design principles. Um, and we were armed back in 2019, 2020 with this new knowledge and this new theory. Uh, but we realized that wasn't enough because what we found is that at that time, the pandemic hit and we were meant to be developing this idea of academy uh, of adaptive expertise in a fully online environment. And our audience, educational leaders, across Victoria had a preference for face-to-face. -face. So we were, we found ourselves with this adaptive challenge of, oh my God, how do we actually develop this type of skills in an online dynamic? And so we started experimenting with different uh, modes um, and I'll, I'll walk you through different frameworks on how to envision that. And we realized that, uh, again, you know, uh, often it is really difficult uh, for us to take people on the journey and um, have them change the framework and the way they envision um, creating professional learning. Um, so after um, it's been a year uh, and a half, almost two years of a really intense journey of trying to find how to approach this idea of adaptive expertise and we'll go there. And so what we'll talk to you about today is a work in progress approach uh, that involves a co-design approach with our providers in the government. We work with providers who are the content developers um, and the facilitators, and um, we, how we manage that through a series of onboarding and um, our course development process. So just keep in mind that. And at this point, I'm going to invite Cheryl uh, come over and talk to us about this adaptive expertise concept. And so can I just get everyone to put up their hands if they've ever heard of the term adaptive expertise before? I know for me it wasn't something that I was familiar with in higher education. So we've got 
just a couple of people who have heard of adaptive expertise. And so adaptive expertise is really looking at a problem and understanding that it's a problem that hasn't been solved before and having this really inquiry based mindset into looking at why this problem exists and what this problem actually is. Um, and so it was defined by um, the OECD as the ability to apply meaningfully learned knowledge and skills flexibly and creatively in different situations. And so we obviously had a couple of experts, Helen Timpley and Kay Twyford, who were working with us really closely to kind of define these ideas and see how we could use them in the K to 12 education sector. And so when Helen and Kay are talking about adaptive expertise, they're talking about evaluatively. And so that's using data to help us make decisions. They're talking about knowledgeably, that is making sure that we're using um, expert knowledge, either what we already have or something that we need to go and get. Metacognitively is making sure that we're thinking about how we're approaching this problem. Are we playing into our biases or are we looking for evidence that maybe challenges our biases and lets us take another step forward? Collaboratively, because we can't solve any of these problems by ourselves. Responsively is we've tried something, now has it worked? Hasn't it worked? Let's go back and evaluate it. Let's talk to everyone else involved and see how it's going. And maybe we're going to change course. Maybe we're going to persist. Maybe we're just going to smooth off a couple of rough edges. And systema systematically, which is looking at it as, as a system. And so making sure that we're looking at our problem, both in the context of a teacher in a classroom but also at a principal in a school who has lots of teachers in lots of classrooms and also as the Victorian education system where we've got lots of principals who are looking after lots of teachers who are looking after lots of classrooms. And that idea that changes that we can introduce into the Victorian system will have intended and unintended effects all the way down to students in prep um, or and, and principals and teachers. And so this adaptive expertise is making sure that we're using every approach that we can to solve problems well. Um, and so adaptive expertise is really about complex challenges. It's not about how do I make sure that kids are able to get on buses. It's about how do we make sure kids are able to get on buses to arrive at school ready to learn. Um, and so it's not about the timetabling of getting a bus route sorted. It's about making sure that the school is starting at the right time to make sure that students can get there um, when they're dealing with all their other consequences. And so if we talk about routine expertise, that's it can be a really complicated challenge, but it's a challenge that we've already encountered before and someone somewhere in the world has solved. Um, and whereas an adaptive challenge is almost a unique problem, a problem that has never got a single solution and has not necessarily been solved in a way that can be transplanted to your school or your situation exactly. It's about seeing the patterns that have emerged in your specific context, seeing what's interacting and what is influencing those and trying to push them in a direction that is a solution that you're looking for. So if you're trying to increase attendance, could be that offering breakfast at school, having a breakfast club, helps your students arrive at school ready to learn. That may or may not solve your problem. It might have solved someone else's problem. And if you're in a really high socioeconomic area, running a breakfast club probably isn't going to change your attendance. Whereas if you're in a, an area with lower resource availability or a much higher proportion of working families, running a breakfast club before school might get students to school earlier, it might get them there and ready to learn. Um, and so if we move on to the next slide, I'm just going to ask you to take a moment and think about your job and what you do. And so thinking about what you've already done today, so it's lunchtime, what's a situation where you have used routine expertise? And so that might be a domain knowledge that you have, that you've solved a problem. 
And so if you just want to write that into the chat. So what's a, a routine expertise, a situation where you've used routine expertise to solve it? I'm just going to be, be quiet for a moment while you type. And if you just want to type it in and um, wait a moment and then I'll tell you to press send and we can have them all come in together. So I'll just let you have a moment to write your sentence about a situation where you have used routine expertise already today. And if you want to press send and send it into the chat. And so for myself, it was actually getting connected here. I know how to connect my computer to the internet. But the very first phone I picked up, when I tried to hotspot it, it wasn't working. And so I used my routine expertise by turning it off, turning it on again. That wasn't working. Let me pick up a different phone and try and turn the hotspot on and connect. Um, and so that's just it's a reasonably technically complex challenge, but actually it's routine. We already know how to do this. Um, we've talked about, Colin was talking about implementing technology. Um, invoices being paid. Yeah, they're routine expertise. They have really well known problems. Um, and then, yeah, just logistical challenges. And so, yeah, they're examples of routine expertise. And so if we move on to the next slide. When we think about what types of challenges we're facing, we can have a solution that is on the vertical axis. And so if we press the button one more time, Nope, we'll talk about problems first. And so if we talk about problems, problems can be clearly defined and previously solved by someone. And so that's how to connect a computer to a hotspot. Or it can be over to loosely defined with no successfully solved solution. So no one's ever actually solved this problem before. And so we need to make sure that we're just iterating on it. We need to kind of keep trying to define what our problem is and look for what might be working to solve it. Um, and so that's problem complexity. And so we can map problems across anywhere on that spectrum. And then with solutions, there can be a really clearly defined solution. Turn it off and on again. Works for 90% of our technical challenges. But when it doesn't work, what do you do? You're now kind of moving up into that adaptive expertise challenge. If you try all of those really common solutions, I turned it off, I turned it on, I turned it off, I waited for my capacitor to discharge and then I turned it back on again. Okay, I've done all of those things, now I'll try to update it. And you, you kind of start moving into the adaptive, from the routine challenge over into the adaptive challenge. And so our routine is when we've got a really clearly defined problem and the problem has a really clearly defined solution. So we're working with known things and predictable solutions. If we then move up, and so if we work with quite a simple problem, but we're trying to find a creative solution to it because we don't like the one that exists, in some respects, it's inefficient effort. And so that's the top left quadrant. It's inefficient effort because the problem has already been solved. If you walk down to the street and buy a charger, you will solve your power problem. <laughs> um, but you can innovate on that and you can find different ways of, of solving that problem. Um, and if you've got time to do it, that's a really great time, space to be in. But if you're time poor, trying to find a new solution isn't necessarily the best use of effort. Um, if we then go across to the top where we have an unknown solution and a loosely defined problem, that's when we're really working in that adaptive expertise area. We're trying new ideas, we're trying new approaches, we're using evidence to try and move things forward. And then if we go down to the bottom right, where we've got ineffective effort, where we've got a really complex problem, we've loosely defined what it is, and we're trying to apply our known solutions to it, really what we're doing is band-aiding it. It could be that you can um, solve a problem or appear to solve a problem, but it's probably low hanging fruit and it's probably not working at the system level. So you might get it working for a small group or a small classroom, but you're probably not solving this problem for the whole system. And so does anyone have any questions on that? Okay, I'm going to ask you now to kind of see how you're going with this. 
Lise, I'm going to ask you to read out a couple of um, common situations that I think will feel familiar to us. And I'm going to ask you in the audience to just write into the chat as Lise reads out the sentence. Um, which category would you put it into? So one was innovating, two was adaptive expertise, three was routine expertise, and four was kind of that low hanging fruit. It's a, it's a solution <laughs> that probably isn't gonna work for your problem. So Lise, did you wanna read those out? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm just gonna have to uh, stop sharing because I can't actually see you or if I'm sharing and I can't um, really see um, the, my notes. So um, the first one is developing a learning outcome for a first year engineering maths course. What, what quadrant do you think that actually falls into? Again, developing a learning outcome for a first year engineering maths course. So learning outcomes, we kind of like them having verbs, we kind of like them being measurable. We kind of know what a good learning outcome is, we kind of know what a maths course is going to teach. So yeah, that's an example of routine expertise. Yeah. Next one is co-developing curriculum with learners. So this is letting your learners have a lot of agency. And they might direct you down a path. You probably end up with some really innovative solutions. And for people who are picking one, is it because you think it might be a really strong investment in time where you've got, you're possibly going to sink a lot of time into co-developing it, but not necessarily be able to reuse it in future years? And so it could be one, it could be two. It is a very loosely defined outcome that you're looking for. Yeah. Third one is solve a student access issue to your LMS. It's a really clearly defined problem and it's probably got quite a straightforward <laughs> once you discover a solution to it. You may not know it as soon as you get that email, but you'll probably be able to find the answer. So Someone we'll just do, do one, one more. One? Yeah, we'll do one more. Supporting student well-being through teaching and learning approaches. Supporting student well-being through teaching and learning approaches. And this is a really good example of adaptive expertise because you really don't know what any individual student needs. You don't really know what any school needs and you don't know what any teacher needs to be able to succeed in supporting a student's well-being. So you're trying to shift a lot of things that you're not directly influencing. And there's lots of interventions that support well-being, but are they going to work for your specific learners or not? So yeah, that's an example of adaptive expertise. It's very relevant for us at the moment as well. Um, given the nature of schools and the needs that they have at the moment. So now that we've got kind of an idea of what adaptive expertise is, I'm going to invite you to take a moment to think about something that you do on a regular basis, which requires you to use adaptive expertise. I'm going to give you two minutes for this one. Um, and so again, if you just want to write your sentence into the chat, and then in two minutes time, I will ask you to send it. Can I give a little tip here, Cheryl, or should I wait for that? Of course, everyone likes support. Yeah, so usually, you know, the way that I know that I'm, I'm dealing with an adaptive expertise or an adaptive challenge mm -hmm. is often when I, it involves people and I have to bring them along with me. Um, so that's, a, that's one way of me being able to identify that. And so for anyone who hasn't, do you want to post that into the chat? And for everyone else, if you just want to have a read of it and comment if you notice anything that you find interesting. 
if anyone would like to speak to their comment, please feel free to take yourself off mute and speak. And so I really relate to um, George's comment around student retention and that idea of kind of how do you solve that problem? How do you make sure that your learners are getting what they need when they need it to be able to commit to their learning? And sometimes it's factors completely without outside of the university's control. And sometimes there's, there are different layers to that factor as well. It may involve, um, you know, different parts of this of the student's life, and um, we may or may not have access to those parts. So, yeah, it is a very um, adaptive challenge. I think the the silence means that, you know, people are on board with the concept. Any noticings and wonderings that you have before we move on? I think that's a yes. Let's, how about we move on, Cheryl? Is that okay? Sounds good. Excellent. And so just bringing this in, um, we've got adaptive expertise, but many of you are likely familiar with some of the higher order thinking. And so um, lots of universities went really deep, deep into higher order thinking. Um, and so the idea that you want to make sure that you're aiming for higher level outcomes. And so in the Victorian education sector, and again, we're talking about K to 12, um, one of our commitments is to make sure that we're supporting learners to reach these higher order outcomes. Um, and so we talk about um, higher order thinking about their transfer. So if I teach you something about um, Australia, currency, can you transfer that to Canadian currency? Can you transfer that to another context? And so that's taking knowledge that you have in one situation and using it in a new one. Um, critical thinking, that ability to reason, reflect and decide on what to do next or what to investigate next. And that's really connect it to adaptive expertise and kind of trying to define your problem and look forward and problem solving. Um, and so that's how do I approach a task that doesn't really have a single clear solution or doesn't have a single solution that I've been able to learn previously. And so higher order thinking is in a number of frameworks. And so we all kind of have our favorite frameworks that we tend to go back to. And so as we look at these different frameworks, what's your favorite framework? Are you a solo type person? Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the web depth of knowledge. That was one that I got from um, the Victorian uh, from Department of Education. Um, Blooms, and then we've got things like Miller's Pyramid. So we've just got a quick little slide for you. And I was wondering, what's your favorite framework? And so you should be what able to do you that QR. Yep. And this is the um, you can go to slido.com with that hashtag and access or I believe Cheryl is dropping the link into the chat. But even if you don't have a favorite, what is the one that you use the most as well? That's a Oh, just wait I definitely wait started off my career in Blooms, but once I discovered Miller's, I was quite quite taken by it. No, does shows kind of that that clinical skills and that representation was something that really worked quite nicely. And oh, for me, so. I go beyond the um, the technical skills or the clinical disciplines. Sorry, I think that link is actually pointing to a different poll. Uh, I can see something passive, active, constructive, interactive. Hmm. Okay, let me just solve that problem in just one moment. Uh, I can see two responses in there, but apologies if you have the wrong link. Uh, Heather's got it. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> This is the wonderful thing about being with a group of technically enabled people. Okay, so you got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Let us just get to where we were. 
give you one more second there. All right, it seems Bloom so far, it seems to be our winner. Um, it would be interesting to see, there's a couple of people that are saying other. Um, would you just like to tell us which one or just take yourself off mute or put it in the chat? So institutional guidelines there from Penny. I also chose other, I'm not sure if this is entirely right, I guess. I base a lot of my learning design around um, Malice principles of adult learning, mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. similar but different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I'll show you a little bit of um, of what we've we've considered in our journey in a bit. So yeah, definitely. Um, let's move on to the next one. And. Um, this is a really, this was, the, the section was meant to help you link the, the concept of adaptive expertise, which I know it's highly related to professional learning of educational leaders. So it's very related to our own government um, context here in the school system. Um, but I know that a lot of you are, higher in, uh, are in higher education and um, maybe some of you are in school. So there is a way to actually find links between the concepts in there. Now, as I was mentioning, we do have a work in progress. So now we understand, hopefully we have an understanding of the concept. How do we do it? How do we go about it? How do we? How are we trying to actually foster um, this adaptive expertise in a fully online environment? So, when we first um, started, sort of pondering, and, and when I first sort of started thinking, and 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 I, I I had conversations with Cheryl around this, I went back to my days in the Learn Analytics Research Group at the University of Melbourne, and had a colleague in there who is a huge fan of the ICAP framework, which basically, and I'm not going to go too deep into it, but it's about, it's a framework that kind of leads you to develop activities um, based on cognitive engagement, and it guides you to actually write your learning outcomes based on um, different types of activities that you can um, create in order to guide your learners to learn by thinking. So it's all about cognitive engagement, it's about learning by thinking. So I started experimenting with creating activities around this passive, you know, situation, you know, creating a mix of that and, and, and maybe doing a little bit more active stuff with through inquiry, through, um, you know, uh, different, uh, you know, organizing and um, trying to get uh, learners to, um, you know, do a lot of dialoguing uh, around uh, that social aspect of learning, uh, either in the workshops or uh, in the discussion boards, with the objective that they would actually construct a plan for school improvement in their work. Now, the thing is that I was, even though, you know, I was, you know, we were trying to, you know, figure out, okay, how do we go about this development of adaptive expertise? What we realized is that that this is about learning by thinking. And before I tell you how do we progress through it, I'm gonna ask you, I know we haven't gone through a lot there, but I'm gonna ask you to look at the second poll and five of you have already, are superstars and have already moved forward and started answering. But if you can just tell us, based on this ICAP framework, think about the, the last course that you've designed what type of activities were the most common? Give you a couple minutes there just to see if the answers change here. Yep, yep. And it's interesting, right? That idea of actively um, sort of, uh, you know, manipulating content and constructing ideas and coming up with plans and ideation and all that stuff seems to be really popular here. Um, and it's interesting because if we think about more traditional design approaches, you know, a lot of, um, I've done a lot of professional learning this year specifically, and I was moving from, you know, passive to social, passive to social, passive to social, right? And I I thought, well, you know, initially that was great, but but if you base it on solely on that, then you may be, you know, 
learning how to talk about it, um, but is that enough? And what we found in, I'm going to move on now, but what we found in our approach is that what we needed, yes, it's great that you're learning by thinking, but what adaptive expertise requires, because it's about using complex capabilities and transferring them to another context, we needed our learners to learn by applying. And so the way that we evolved is that we started doing a little bit more research and Cheryl and I got together and we're like, okay, so what do we do? How do we go about it? So we, uh, at the moment, this is our work in progress. We have started um, classifying our learning task and basing our onboarding and our co-creation around this concept of the open university initially. And I'm, I know a lot of you will be really familiar with this. Um, classification of learning tasks and just to sort of remind you or to sort of inform you if you haven't seen it the open university in 2016 they, um, they, they did a, a little bit of an evaluation of 151 of their learning designs um, to determine exactly what, was, what were indicators of success, um, of, of learning and, and success in their courses. And what they saw is a, a, a correlation, a negative correlation, in fact, between activities or courses that were asking uh, participants um, you know, to engage in that, that type of more traditional design that I just described of let's assimilate, let's watch a video, let's listen to something, then let's talk about it in the discussion board. Watch a video, read something, talk about it in the discussion board. And when you do that, you know, over and over again, what they found is that there was a direct correlation well, not direct, but there was um, indication that that type of design was leading to unsuccessful outcomes, such as students dropping out, um, you know, uh, low learning achievement, et cetera, et cetera. So what they decided to do, and they opened it, and now I think the UN, uh, was it the UN, Cheryl, that adopted this in their sustainable uh, learning um, principles is that uh, what they suggested is how about we are more explicit in our language and we classify our learning tasks so that we're not um, favoring one over the other. Rather, what we want to create is an is it is an experience that engages learners in their in their learning journey through a considered and mindful selection and mix of these different types of tasks. So if we if we just take a minute, uh, Cheryl, just for the participants that are not familiar with the classification itself, and then I'll lead you into how we're using it at the moment for this adaptive expertise concept. Just want you to know that in this, uh, in this uh, classification, an assimilative experience is one that guides the learner to read, listen, see, or review a piece of information. Cheryl, do you want to jump in to help us understand the finding and handling information? And so when you're finding and handling information, it's when you go out and you're actively searching for new information. And so that's new information to you. It's not necessarily new information to the discipline. But I, Cheryl, didn't know who the traditional owners of the land that I'm meeting on today were. So I had to go and find that information. And so I'm on the land of the Innu people because I'm in Quebec at the moment. And so that was new information for me. And so I had to go and find that. And so that's a task that you can set up where you ask people to go and find something new for them related to the topic you're discussion, discussing. A communicative information is really powerful as well. It's where we guide the learner to discuss information related to the content, at least with one other person. You know, traditionally, it can be in the discussion boards, it can be through breakout rooms in um, an online context, or it can be in small group or larger group conversations. The power of a communicative activity, however, is that often when you are led to articulate a concept, you are sort of embedding and sort of uh, uh, solidifying that learning around the terminology and around the language of that concept. 
And then when you move on to an experiential task, that's when you go and you take something that you've learned or something that you're learning about and you apply it in your own context. And so you take an idea and you apply it in your school. That allows you to gather information, evaluate the effectiveness and get feedback from your peers, teachers, students on the approach that you're using to be able to refine it for the future. So you actually get to take an idea and practice it. It could be prototyping it almost. And so it's about embodying that learning, right? Feeling it, hearing it, you know, talking about it, sensing what people are saying around it. And it, the productive one, it's sort of, um, it's sort of a really uh, important task as well for us it, because it's what leads to that ideation of, all right, I am a principal in this concept context, how am I going to come up with a plan that helps my school improve in their teaching and learning approaches? So what you're doing is guiding learners to use their knowledge and skills um, in collaboration to create an idea, a plan, or a piece of work together. And what's important before we go to the other ones, in, in this, in our current application of the task and how it links to adaptive expertise, again, it's important. We don't want to actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, use one type of task over another. It's about you using a mindful and a very conscious selection and mix of these tasks. But if you think about an experiential or productive, you need to use all of the other, all of the previous knowledge that you've gained through all of the other tasks to build up to the, the skills to a point where you can embody or produce um, an idea. Right? So, um, that is where we think in our current approach is we're working up in our in our in our courses we're working up creating a very mindful um, you know mix of this task to work up to experimental and productive which is where we think um, that this adaptive expertise will be fostered um, and further developed in our educational leaders. Jill, do you want to tell us about interactive? And then an interactive um, task is something where learners are able to simulate what will happen. And so if I invest a million dollars in each Victorian school, what do I expect the outcome to be? If I focus it on maths, what type of outcome do I expect? If I focus it on languages, what type of outcome do I expect? If I focus that money onto social emotional learning, what outcomes do I expect? And so if you can run a simulation where you can invest more money into things or you can try running the pilot um, and just get some simulated data, it can help you understand what the consequences of your actions are without actually negatively impacting your students, your learners, your community. And so having that opportunity to simulate and get really rapid feedback allows you to have an idea that you could then further develop in a productive task. And so it's just really quick feedback. It could be as simple as a multiple choice question. If I was in this situation, what piece of knowledge do I need? Um, it could be as simple as that through to something like SimCity, where should I put a road in this city or not? Um, so your interactives can be varying in complexity um, and they're there to make sure that you're validating and that you've got the right foundational ideas to build on. And just to finalize this classification is, is, is this assessment task. And unlike most of you, we don't actually you know, hand out grades to our educational leaders. It's we are, uh, you, we, we, our context requires something different. It requires the um, strategies to be able to evaluate and monitor your own work as you're going about school. Um, so assessment it, in our 
our context is a little bit different, your context might be uh, different from ours as well, um, and it might be more of a, of a final summative assessment situation, but that is the way that we use that specific task in us. And like Cheryl said, feedback is the key in here. And I know we're actually kind of running out of time, Cheryl, um, but uh, should we just move on or do this slido as well? I think we should do this slido. Okay, so because we have an activity where we want you to sort of talk to each other, but um, let's just do this one really quickly. What we want you to do in that same slido is think about the last course you designed. How much of the course was the simulative activities? 20 and 40. That's interesting. That's very, very interesting. Again, the, the point here is not to preference. It's not that assimilative activities are bad. They're needed. That's where the learning, the formal learning happens. It's just about, remember, be really mindful about your mix in the salad, right? Um, so uh, that's great to see. Cheryl, can you tell us a little bit about how our work in progress is going in one of your projects? And so basically what we're doing is we're going through and designing our programs. We're articulating what type of activity each, each thing is. And so we're going through and categorizing it. And so what assimilative tasks do we have? What communicative tasks do we have? And we're using this as a conversation point with the design team. And so if we all agree that this is what our course looks like currently, we can get commitment, buy-in and motivation to start thinking about maybe integrating a few more experiential or productive tasks. We might think about removing some of our communicative tasks or changing what is being asked of the learner. Maybe they need to do something experiential before they come in and talk about it. And so by being able to classify each of the activities that a learner will encounter through their program, we're able to have really informed conversations and give rich feedback to providers about the learning. Um, and we've had some really great success with our providers being able to see what we mean when we're giving them feedback and giving them suggestions about refining some of these activities. Because we've got language that is understood across the whole design team, which has been really helpful in getting us to move our designs forward and supporting our learners to have really lovely interactive experiences that support the development of adaptive expertise. I think what's key in what Cheryl is doing, it's not so much the quality control situation, although it does lead to hopefully an enhanced quality of the learning experience. What is important in what uh, Cheryl is doing for us as learning designers is that we have the power of language and the power of understanding where we need to negotiate the quality of learning that will be happening in our courses and be really informed about that. So at this point, we had, we have five minutes and I wonder if, um, rather than going into breakout room, Cheryl, I wonder if we can actually um, have participants pick one of these three questions in here. So one of the questions is what factors do we need to consider and address when designing learning that addresses adaptive expertise or higher order thinking if that is uh, more related to your own context? What is the balance between tools and resources which scaffold design rather than producing cookie cutter learning and we uh, I'll, be, I'll see what you think about that. And how does the approach described today relate to the same learning design approach you are currently using? So I'll give you a minute to choose one question, think about it, and then I invite you to either share it in the chat or if you could please raise your hand so that we actually have a, a little bit less of chaos and we, we can give... Um, a more respectful space to anybody that would like to contribute. So I'll be quiet for a minute, pick one, uh, and, and then let's just share. 
think at this point I'm going to stop sharing um, because I can't really see you and I can't really participate unless I stop sharing. So any comments in the chat? Anybody who would like to do just some final um, closing comments on any of those questions? And Georgie, that was going to be our final message to you, was to think about how you can use universal design for learning to make sure that you're meeting the needs of each and every learner, because each and every learner's needs are unique. They're different. And if we can use that really comprehensive design approach that universal design for learning suggests, um, you get a really great, rich experience for everyone. <laughs> That was, in fact, our last slide today, but uh, we did, we've run out of time, unfortunately. So we'll try to, um, that could be uh, another um, session in the future. Well, thank you so much, Lisa and Cheryl. That was, that was just like a, a huge tidal wave of thoughts and ideas, and I am still processing them, to be honest. Um, see, there's a lot of love in the chat. Uh, yes, these are absolutely uh, all recorded, so the recording will be available in the next few days, and we'll share links and do all of the things that we normally do. Um, so I guess if there are any other questions or comments that people have, uh, and again, thanks again, uh, Lisa and Cheryl, that was really wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, Cheryl, hope you have a wonderful break and vacations. Love you. Oh, yes. And, and Cheryl's actually coming to us from um, Quebec at the moment. So it's 11 o'clock there now. So we do appreciate your sacrifice. No, it's great to get to hear what everyone's thinking and kind of share some of this work with you. Lisa has been a really great driver for it. The Academy has been really supportive of it. And there's so much that can be happened and it's just this integration of ideas so it's really lovely to see that there's kind of some really nice synergies here